This next panel is the first one that we've done uh, in a collaboration with a publishing series. In this case, it's the Jewish Live series published by Yale. And uh, the reason that this was very fortunate for us uh, is that it enabled us to bring in some people uh, that we might not otherwise have been able to flying from long distances. And uh, our moderator will introduce you to them, but let me introduce you to the moderator. Uh, Ruth Franklin, oh, and I do want to acknowledge uh, Stephen Zipperstein, who could not be here, and Eileen Smith at Farrar and at Yale Press uh, for making this happen. Ruth Franklin is a book critic and senior editor at the New Republic. Her first book, A Thousand Darknesses, Lies and Truth and Holocaust Fiction, was published by Oxford last year to glowing reviews. The Atlanta called it a towering work of criticism and insight. The book was a finalist for the 2012 Sammy Rohr Prize in Jewish Literature and is now available in paperback. Tablet Magazine recently named her one of our most important critics under 40. Not many of us are under 40. She has written for many publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, The Jewish Review of Books, and Salma Gundy, to which she contributes a regular film column. She received the 2012 Guggenheim Fellowship in Biography and the 2012 Roger Shattuck Prize for Criticism. She is currently a fellow of the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library and is working on a biography of the writer Shirley Jackson. Please welcome Ruth Franklin. Thank you. First, I just want to make sure that my mic is on. It indeed appears to be. Um, good. So I'll introduce our panelists and then um, start some, hopefully start some conversation among us. Greg Bellow worked for 40 years as a psychoanalytically oriented psychotherapist and is a member of the core faculty of the Sandville Institute. He also is the eldest son of Saul Bellow, who is the subject of his new memoir, memoir cum biography. I think one, one thing that maybe we'll talk about is the difference between these two forms. The book is called Saul Bellow's Heart. Uh, Joshua Rubenstein is a senior advisor at Amnesty International USA and a longtime associate at Harvard University's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. He is the author and editor of numerous books about Russia, including Tangled Loyalties, The Life and Times of Ilya Ehrenberg, The KGB File of Andrei Sakharov, and Stalin's Secret Pogrom, which won a National Jewish Book Award. His new book is Leon Trotsky, A Revolutionary's Life. And Steve Weitzman is the director of the Taube Center for Jewish Studies and Daniel E. Koshland Professor of Jewish Culture and Religion at Stanford University. His books include Song and Story in Biblical Narrative, Surviving Sacrilege, The Jews, A History, and his new biography, Solomon, The Lore of Wisdom. So, I want to start out by pointing out the obvious. These are three very different books. <laughs> um, but I, what I want to start off by focusing on is that in different ways, you've all written forms of unauthorized biography. Um, Steve talks about going beyond the tradition in his portrait of Solomon. And Joshua is taking an unconventional look at one of the major figures of 20th century Russian history. Meanwhile, Greg's book is a deeply personal reflection on his father's life. So I'd like to begin by asking you each to talk a little bit about the approach that you chose towards your subject and what motivated that approach. Um, so when I uh, invoked that idea of the unauthorized biography, I, I had in mind a kind of pun on the authorized version of the Bible. And I saw what I was doing as kind of the opposite of the Bible. Um, Solomon is the ultimate authority figure in biblical narrative. And he's an authority figure whose life and whose tragic downfall calls into question any kind of authority, especially intellectual authority. So I saw this book, um, a book about a figure who is a complete mystery to us. We know nothing about King Solomon. I saw this book as an opportunity to kind of explore intellectual authority, the kind of authority that I'm, as, as, as a scholar, I'm supposed to have. And um, saw the book as a kind of, um, kind of an exploration of the limits of intellectual authority. How do you write about a historical figure about whom there's so little information available outside the Bible? 
Uh, good question. That was the question that I asked myself <laughs> for many months before I started this project. Um, we know actually nothing about King Solomon. We have the biblical account, actually accounts. We have more than one account in the Bible, that of the books of Kings and that of the books of Chronicles. But we, um, there's nothing in those accounts that can be verified according to the standards of modern historiography. Archaeologists have been looking for Solomon for more than 100 years and have found nothing conclusive. Facts that we thought we knew about King Solomon have turned out not to be facts. So all I could really do in the end was examine other people's efforts to find King Solomon. And in a way, that's what the book is. It's a, it's a series of expeditions into expeditions of other people's efforts to uh, find this elusive figure. Josh, what about you? Yeah, sure. Um, well, when I was first asked to write uh, this biography of Trotsky, I, I had a question which others raised in the reviews of the book, which is why is a figure like Trotsky in a Jewish Lives series? Because he did, in some ways, reject his uh, Jewish identity, not his Jewish origins. Uh, but as I did my research and came across material, some of which others had commented on and some they had not, I found repeated references to Jewish suffering uh, in very personal ways that other revolutionaries did not engage in. And in the end, I had to conclude that Trotsky was more of a Jew uh, than uh, he thought he was and that others, that he was more of a Jew in spite of himself. And the key moment for me was when I, uh, when I read two things. First, his accounts of the Mendel Bayless trial. Uh, Trotsky is in Vienna when the trial is unfolding in Kiev, and he's reading day-by-day -day accounts and commenting on it, and he's very angry uh, with the Tsarist government. And then he recalls this moment in his anger over Bayless after World War II has begun, and he invokes the image of Mendel Bayless as his image for what is about to happen to Europe that Europe is the same as this vulnerable Jew who's being sacrificed. And I felt only someone who had some deep Jewish loyalty, no matter how hidden, no matter how concealed, no, how, no matter how deep, that that was there. And then throughout this uh, book, I find threads of, that, of those feelings, especially in response to physical attacks on Jews, that he expresses from the 1905 revolution on. So this is one of the threads of the book that I I felt I was contributing in ways that other biographers had not. As I see it, the particular challenge of your book is almost the opposite of the challenge of Steve's book in that you're, telling, you're retelling a life that's already been very well documented. Yes, very well documented, but you know, I'm, uh, I'm not a follower. Uh, I never met Trotsky. Um, I, I'm not Isaac Deutsch, who wrote this magnificent book, but in some ways, I have to say, wrong-headed. It's just so full of praise and adulation for Trotsky, which I cannot share. Um, and then there's a, a recent biography by Robert Service, who's a very well-known uh, historian in England, that I think goes too far in his criticism of Trotsky, both on personal grounds and on other grounds. So I, I did find some personal sympathy for Trotsky because of his suffering, his own fate, the fate of his children, grandchildren disappeared from history, his courage in opposing Stalin, all that I want to acknowledge. Uh, but in the end, his legacy is as a revolutionary who created a revolution that, in the end, you know, uh, wrought, wrought a great deal of destruction. Greg, I want to invite you, as introduction to your book, to read the passage that you had selected. Well, let, let me try to uh, uh, answer the per first question, and, sure. and then I'll do that. Uh, as a memoirist, I feel a little bit like a fish out of water. Um, because what my challenge was to weave a coherent narrative out of subjective facts. In other words, um, I sort of see what I've done as a, ver as a kind of speak memory. Uh, and most of my data really comes out of my memories of my father, the stories that he told me, uh, you know, my, the, the life history that I knew about, the life history that I participated in, and I've also tried to say something about uh, the books and what, where, where there, there are places in the books where I feel that he speaks very much from the heart, which is the source of my title. Uh, and I came prepared with a little snippet uh, to sort of illustrate the way in which I try to weave these things together because I am um, very interested in the response of biographers to a memoirist who uses an acknowledged different frame of reference and and methodology. So if you'll bear with me, I asked the panel's permission to read a snippet because 
I think it'll give you a better flavor than I'm able to give you about what I, what I have in mind. Let's hear it. So um, the other thing I would say is that my father would be tickled to uh, be on the panel where Trotsky and Solomon, and he, <laughs> uh, you know, were, were the subjects. Uh, you know, he was, uh, he, he was an early Trotskyite. He, uh, um, there is, there is a, a book just about to be published by the University of Kentucky Press about his politics, which contains uh, extensive interviews with my brothers and I uh, as, the last, as the final chapter. Um, and there is a story, I don't, do you know that there's a story about my father and Trotsky? Yes, it's in the book. It's, I was all excited to hear, actually, to read your book and hear the story because it was mentioned to me that there was an intersection, in fact, between Bella and Trotsky, but then I was disappointed to learn about their meeting that only Bella was alive. <laughs> That's correct. I, I, I'll, I'll tell the story if you wish. Um, my, my parents were in Mexico in 1940, um, I'm, I, and uh, they were with another couple, Herb and Cora Passan. Uh, Herb Passan was a very well-known anthropologist and sociologist who was a lifelong friend of my father's. And they were both deeply committed Trotskyites. They were in Tosco, and they were arranged. One of Trotsky's bo uh, bodyguards was a friend of theirs from Chicago, and they arranged to meet Trotsky, which was not easy to do because he was very highly protected in, in Mexico, although obviously not very well not protected, protected, not protected enough. enough. <laughs> and so they went to Mexico City, <clears throat> and it was the day they arrived, the day of the assassination. And uh, he was dead when they got there. But there was all this confusion, and in the confusion, they ended up going to the morgue and seeing his body still with uh, congealed blood and bandages all over his head. And um, they th the, the police thought they, they, I don't know, when they passed themselves off as American journalists or they assumed that they were American, you know, they were. But my father must have told the story 50 times. So speaking of <clears throat> telling stories 50 times, that's really where a lot of the information that I have comes from. <laughs> so let me take the liberty and the time and then I'll defer it and because I don't really want to hog it too much, but it won't give you much of a sense unless I do this. This is a, a snippet from the, of, that I cobbled together, but basically it describes uh, my father's reaction to his father's death, my grandfather's death, and how he treats that and, and sees the day. Uh, let me just contextualize it by saying my first chapter is called Paradise, in which I convey those are the first eight years of his life in Lachine, and the second chapter I call Paradise Lost where I feel that he um, experiences the, the success that they met in Chicago as opposed to the poverty of the immigrant years. And there was an epidemic of self-interest that broke out in, amongst the Bellow family after the years of privation where altruism and my grandmother's altruism, altruism prevailed. And I feel that a lot of my father's altruism came, and his interest in Trotsky, I think, came as a derivative to some extent of that altruism. Anyway, so um, I will just go on. Uh, Saul's choice to pursue a literary life was his version of the epidemic of self-interest that took over the Bell Bellow family after Leisha's death. Leisha was my grandmother. In contrast to the mutual sacrifices of family life in Lachine, I began, became to feel that Saul and the Bellow family had lost the paradise of innocence after a decade of material success in Chicago. The losses were multiple, but most important was the absence of communal interest Leisha engendered. It was not fully apparent, the loss of it was not fully apparent until my father, my grandfather's death 20 years later. During um, grandpa's last years, the entire Bella family, including Saul, when he was in town, went over to Abraham's and Aunt Fanny. Aunt Fanny was the woman he married almost immediately after my grandmother died, for a Sunday afternoon meal. When Grandma Alicia's name came up, her children spoke with her of great reference, and the afternoons were largely ha um, harmonious until the conversation turned to money. Saul argued with his father about money, and Abraham found, that, as Abraham found that the, my grandfather was named Abraham, and the best way to reassert his waning parental authority was to threaten to disinherit his children. Frequent fights uh, with his children ended in Grandpa's threat to cha change his will, and he often called them in the middle of the night, 
threatening that he would uh, uh, call uh, his lawyer the next morning. My uncle Maury, who was a financial success, quickly tired of this routine early on and turned his nose up at his share. But Abraham's mercurial threats had uh, serious consequences for Sam and Jane, who were my aunt and uncle, and Saul, whose fragile finances made him particularly vulnerable. My father would rush back to Chicago to learn about the new will. But by the time the family had assembled at Grandpa's insistence to hear of the new asset division, he and the offending child had patched things up and the crisis would blow over until Abraham pulled the same stunt again and the scene was repeated. And my father must have gone to Chicago at least half a dozen times. In 1955, Grandpa died of a fatal heart, heart attack. Um, uh, Maury, my uncle, used his ex ex extensive political connections to secure a police escort with sirens from the synagogue to the cemetery. Saul joked about the irony that Abraham, who was running from the police most of his life, <laughs> uh, was accompanied by them on his final journey. After the funeral, Aunt Fanny confessed to Saul that Grandpa wanted to have sex even the evening before he died, but she put him off because he had the sniffles. Her story cemented my father's awe of Abraham as the tough, horny old bird that he was. Despite their arguments, one of which included the threat to come after Saul with a gun if he ever asked for money again, Saul grieved deeply. When Ruth Miller, a former student who wrote a literary memoir, came to pay a condolence call, she found my father weeping as he listened to Mozart's Requiem. Seize the Day reflects my, Saul's lost hope for approval from his father. Abraham was not only unable to show Saul his love, but also formed a critical judgment of his youngest as an overgrown crybaby who failed to absorb his single lesson in life that life had taught him the lesson of emotional toughness. I think my father agreed, but could do little to control his emotions. A film version of the novel was produced some decades later. The actor Joseph Weissman, who played Tommy Adler, Tommy, uh, uh, Dr. Adler, uh, Tommy Wilhelm's father, bore an uncanny resemblance to Grandpa and perfectly captured his harshness towards his son. After having witnessed such scenes between my father and grandfather, I was riveted as Tommy begged his implacable father for money. I mentioned how st struck I was by the film to several family members, uh, and, the, and the praise got back to my father. Saul, who believed writing was a far better way to capture the essence of people than film, took offense. On our next visit, he complained about what he took to be my lack of appreciation, appreciation for his novel, and he extended his criticism to my lack of literature as a whole. I told him that I continued to read great writers of fiction, but that I could not appreciate his books as literature. They're just too close, Pop, I said. And as his habit when he liked Len, like it or not, confronted by an irrefutable position, he remained silent and never brought up the subject again. While his father was alive, Saul hoped to penetrate Abraham's mask of family civility. And when Grandpa died in 1955, my father's previous losses now came to include the false innocence he had created as a young boy when he elevated a father brought low by failure in Lachine to the status of a hero. This is uh, spelled out in Herzog extensively. Nowhere is the loss of, and this is the part that I'm most interested in because of the way in which I use the book. Nowhere is the loss of innocence clearer than in Seize the Day, which Saul wrote soon after his father's death. As narrated, Tommy Wilhelm, Wilhelm aspires to be an actor despite being ill-suited to a profession where one must hide one's feelings behind the, theater, the traditional theatrical mask. Dr. Adler, Tommy's father, is a better actor than his son a man of consummate emotional control. A desperate Tommy tries one last time to penetrate Dr. Adler's social facade and touches, touches heart by tearfully attributing the end of family life to his mother's death, i.e. my grandmother, and accusing Dr. Adler at, of relief at her passing. Caught out in his lack of feeling, Dr. Adler gives no quarter, offering only platitudes. Tommy, after failing once again to elicit a human response from his father, asked himself as he had falsely sentimentalized the past. Anticipa anticipating a future stripped of illusion, Tommy needs to mourn his compound losses and wanders into a funeral of, total of, of a total stranger, a place where a grown man can cry freely. <laughs>
So you see the way in which I'm trying to put the experiences that I understand together with the way in which my father covers in the book. And I will defer because I've taken up way more time than I had planned to. Well, I have a few questions that apply very broadly to all of your books, in obviously in different ways. So I'm just going to throw a few of them out there. Sure. And please feel free to build on each other, to speak to each other, maybe not to interrupt each other. But um, anyway, don't, don't wait. you don't need to wait for me to prompt you, is what I'm saying. And I, I, guess I want to start with um, bringing up the point that all of your subjects are larger than life. Um, I'm thinking, uh, Steve, about in your book, um, one thing that really struck me was the most often told story about Solomon, obviously, is the story of the two women and the baby. Um, I had not realized, and this obviously is a credit to my poor knowledge of the Bible, somehow I had either not realized I had forgotten that they were both prostitutes, or also that there were originally two babies involved. Um, and so I wonder, this seemed to me a way in which you kind of you cut through the, the mythologizing of the story and bring it back to the actual facts of the Bible. Um, obviously, there are many other ways, and the same applies for Trotsky and for Bello as well. So I wondered if you could just speak to this. So maybe, I mean, part of, of, of people's relationship to biblical characters is that these figures, they live in this faraway land, in this faraway place, but they're also of our time and our place. And part of the history of biblical interpretation is drawing connections between our lives and, and biblical stories. So maybe I'll address the story of Solomon's baby with a joke. Um, so uh, these two women come before King Solomon, and they are dragging between them a young man. And the first woman says to Solomon, Solomon, I demand justice. This man promised to marry my daughter, and now he's reneging to marry this other woman's daughter, son, daughter. And the other woman says the same thing. He, he promised to marry my daughter, and now he's reneging to marry this first woman's daughter. So Solomon says, I, I know what to do in these kinds of circumstances. Bring me a sword. So they bring him a sword. And he says, OK, I'm going to cut this young man in two, and I'll give half to you, and I'll give half to you. And the first woman says, no, that would be terrible. Don't cut. And the second woman says, no, go ahead and cut. And Solomon says, points to the second woman and says, behold, the true mother-in-law. <laughs> Maybe I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Well, I, um, it's hard to make a joke out of something in Trotsky's life, but um, uh, I think one of the challenges a biographer has in facing a figure like Trotsky is that he did so much writing about himself, and his writing is always very strategic, because um, after all, he writes his wonderful memoir, My Life, while he's in exile, Stalin has sent him first to Central Asia and then to Turkey and Europe. And so he's writing not only to tell his life, but to justify his life. And to confirm that it was he and Lenin who made the revolution, not Stalin. And that as Stalin is falsifying history, he, Trotsky, is saying, no, 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 don't listen to him. Listen to my account, both of his life, his, his memoir, and of course his very famous history of the Russian Revolution, where he's also asserting his place. But that assertion has also many different layers. Because he not only wants to restore his rightful place in that history, but he wants to make it right. Because Stalin is saying, I, Stalin, am the better student of Lenin. And Trotsky is saying, no, no, I was the better student of Lenin. But what Trotsky doesn't want to think of is that maybe Stalin is also a very good student of Trotsky. Because it was Lenin and Trotsky who together rejected democratic values in 1917 that created many of the institutions that Stalin took to such more sinister purposes, the secret police, there were show trials while Trotsky and Lenin were in the, in the Kremlin, all the abuses of the Civil War. I mean, they set up the original dictatorship. And then Trotsky spends the rest of his life saying, yes, we wanted a dictatorship, but not like that one. We had a different kind of dictatorship in mind. So he's always, it's always, every, all of his writing is very strategic, it's very political, his own biography is an act of politics, as in some ways any, any biography is, particularly in that kind of setting, where he's not only, de all, all memoirists are dealing with self-censorship to one degree or another, but in Trotsky's or other writers, they're dealing with the censorship of the regime or against the censorship of the regime. And that's always a quality that, say, our earlier panelists, the transcendentalists, never had to worry about, after all. No one is going to censor Thoreau or Emerson, other than themselves. <laughs> 
And Greg, you start uh, off by talking about the disparity between the public bellow and the private person, as you knew. Correct. Um, you know, I, I wrote my book because I wanted to make it clear that my father was not larger than life. Uh, and that the larger than life component of, of what people know about him is largely uh, the product of uh, the last 20 or 30 years of his life. After he won the Nobel Prize, he became famous. He, he became a, a sort of cultural icon. He uh, took many public positions, many of which I had a great deal of trouble with. Uh, and what I wanted to do is to talk about young, young Saul and old Saul are the two ways in which I talk about the lifespan and that the young Saul, the young Trotskyite, the idealist, uh, the optimist, uh, was replaced uh, by old Saul after the 60s and after going to Israel to cover the Six Day War of, uh, as, a, as a newspaper reporter. Uh, interestingly enough, as when I, in earlier drafts, I called, then later he, he distanced himself from that idealistic youth and and Trotsky. I, and uh, in my early drafts of my book, I used the chapter of revisionist history as, uh, as a way to talk, to talk about the way he swept under this under the rug. It, it was too much of an inside joke, mm -hmm. and the editors took it out. And I mean, it, it's now history is revision, they made it. But it really was, a, it was I was really trying to talk about the, 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 the uh, argument that you were just, just yes. describing about you know, whose version of history is the right version of history. Something that I'm particularly interested in as a biographer in process myself, and I hope you'll excuse the ulterior motive behind m many of my questions, <laughs> I hope to learn from all of you, is how do you deal with facts that are impossible to prove? Um, Steve, obviously this applies it to your book in a very global <laughs> way. <laughs> Big way. <laughs> um, Greg, one thing that comes to my mind, one moment in your book is when you tell the story of your grandfather getting upset after finding a ham in your parents' icebox. And then later in the book, you confess that you, the story might be apocryphal. And I, I, Josh, I assume you've come across conflicting sources in your research as well. How do you handle this situation? Well, I'll say in, in the case of Trotsky, um, you know, there's a, a wonderful story. Uh, he lived in New York for a couple of months in early 1917, and he used to spend time at a, a Jewish dairy restaurant in the Bronx. And um, he wouldn't tip the waiters as a matter of principle, and he would <laughs> harangue the other customers not to tip the waiters because it offended his socialist principles. And you can imagine how this endeared him to the waiters. And, and they would refuse to serve him, and they would spit on him, they would spill soup on him. And, uh, and then he would tell them, but, but you know, I'm, I'm a determined socialist, I'm going back to Russia, I'm going to make a revolution, and they thought he was nuts. <laughs> and the point is that six months later, he and Lenin take over the Russian Empire. And what do we learn? Now, whether that story, how, how much truth there is, I don't know, but there is a kernel of psychological truth. And because I do believe Trotsky was a determined fanatic, and he was willing to assert his personality and his, his, what he took to be his ideals on this little piece of the universe, this Jewish dairy restaurant in the Bronx. Six months later, that same impetus led him to assert and impose his ideology on the largest landmass in the world, the Russian Empire. So there was a kernel, more than a kernel of truth in that story. And I think the source is pretty good, but whether all the details are, are correct, it's hard to say. Steve, how do you deal with the difference between biblical truth and empirical truth? Um. So in my case, I had to resort to biography in the ancient sense of the genre, um, which was um, as practiced by Greeks and Romans, people like Plutarch, where they were not, they didn't have our modern scientific sensibility yet. So they, for them, it wasn't a question of, of trying to document a life or trying to find evidence for a life. For them, they used a life as an opportunity to reflect on, on human experience. Um, so I embraced that ancient conception of the genre and used Solomon's life as an opportunity to think about our ambition to know, to know everything, and what we do when we confront the limitations of our knowledge. So I, I, I went back to an ancient model for that. Let me, uh, I'm going to answer the question, but um, this may remind me of another story, which is that when my father sent my mother an alimony check once, he put in a note saying, 
hooray for socialism in one country. <laughs> the implication, they were, my parents were both Trotskyites. And the implication is, if Trotsky had prevailed, I wouldn't have to send you this check. <laughs> um, the, uh, let me, but let me go to the, I mean, I, I have the easiest answer of all, which is that I'm a memoirist. In other words, I'm relying on my own memory. I, there's no empirical data except what, I, what I'm able to drag out. I mean, I talk to relatives, friends, cousins, for you know, 10 or 15 years before I started to write. And my brother wisely said, make some notes, and I did. Um, but this, there is a story, which is that my, you know, my parents were sitting, living on the south side of Chicago. They were both, this is 1938, uh, they were both active Trotskyites. My father had nothing whatsoever to do with any form of Jewish observation, uh, observance. My grandfather came over, found a ham in my parents' refrigerator, ice box, I guess it's called in those days. Then he went over to my uncle Maury and Aunt Marge's house, and he said, cook me an egg in the shell, which means, in other words, I can't eat your unkosher food any more than I can eat their unkosher food. And then he went on to say that he was shocked to find a, a, a ham in my parents' icebox. The story was told to me by the, the aunt to whom um, my, father, my grandfather was speaking. Uh, and then when I told, repeated the story to my father during the revisionist history party of his life, he said, no, 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 that never happened. But, you know, I'm just pretty sure it did because they really were throwing, you know, uh, Ju Judaism in, the, you know, in, the, in my grandfather's face. My father didn't go to temple. He didn't do anything, you know. He, had, he was not observant during that period of time in his life. He was an avowed Trotskyite. I, I don't know if he ever really considered himself an atheist. Um, and, um, the, the, you know, no, but there is another story which sort of confirms it. So I use a story on top of a story. And the story on top of the story is that he came back to visit on Yom Kippur and borrowed his father's car to go visit his Trotskyite friends on the south side while the rest of the family was tearing their hair out because he was driving a car on, uh, you know, on the high holidays. So it's, it's basically contextual. I mean, the answer, fundamentally, there are some stories that sort of back it up, and, but when it came right down to it, it's really my gut reaction. The other thing is, I tried to preserve the ambiguity in the book. In other words, I tried to stay away from making definitive, declarative statements. Drove my copy editor crazy, because he kept writing in the margins, author, you, you, you know, when did this happen? Why did this happen? And I kept, just crossing it out. Or, I mean, there's a little thing you can write, stet, which is leave it in, 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 the, in the editing. Uh, because it's not clear cut. None of this is clear cut. Well, I think also, uh, one of the things I did in my book, which I, I found uh, surprisingly useful, was I went to the New York Times, something we all read every day, and I saw how the New York Times was covering Trotsky from the mid-20s until his death. And because of the internet, it's very easy to do now. And what was appalling to me is how much they got wrong and how much they were including that was clearly misinformation being circulated by Stalin's regime with all kinds of claims about Trotsky that couldn't conceivably be true. But I use that in the book as a counterweight to what was said about him because he's always responding to it. He's so appalled, he's angry. Once he's in Mexico, and from January 37 on, he has access to the American press, the journals of opinion. He's following what the New Republic, what the nation are saying about the purge trials, and they're apologizing for the purge trials. They're saying it's all true, and Trotsky really is a part of a conspiracy against Stalin and doing all these terrible things. And, and Trotsky's appalled. He's alone. He's helpless. He virtually has no money. And they're saying he's got an army here and an army there, and he's involved in all kinds of conspiracies. But that is part of the story, even when you know that it isn't true, because it's still part of his life. That brings me to the next thing I wanted to consider, which is none of us here, myself included, is the author of the first biography of his or her subject. And so that's an issue, is how do you deal with the challenges of coming after other authors who may have well introduced inaccuracies that are now accepted as fact? And Greg, I know you write that about Bello as well or who simply just chose to emphasize different aspects of your subject's lives, and so the narrative is fundamentally different. How do you kind of reassert yourself 
as the author of a different narrative about your subject? Well, I guess the author I was following was God. Right, so that's very challenging indeed. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, who surprisingly is uh, capable of mistakes, as a biographer at least. Um, so again, I had, to, um, I had to consciously play against the biblical narrative, and I had at my disposal a wonderfully rich tradition of, of reimaginings of the biblical story, um, from ancient Midrash to um, modern novellic retellings, King Solomon's Mines, you know, a score of Hollywood movies. And so I enlisted all those uh, later kind of reimaginers of the story as allies in the telling of my own story. And uh, together we, um, we um, developed an alternative to the biblical account. I mean, do you see yourself as presenting a fundamentally new Solomon in some kind of way? Or are you more sort of building and reimagining the Solomon that we know and love? I'm trying to um, actually reconnect the reader to this fascinating 2,000-year-old interpretive tradition that Solomon has inspired. Um, and that involves theologians and uh, archaeologists and explorers and other kinds of interpreter. So it's really about connecting the reader to other readers. And I don't actually make much of a pretense to understand the real King Solomon. Mm -hmm. Well, just speak for myself. Obviously, I had the challenge of writing after Deutscher's three-volume biography. Uh, but through a good deal of effort, I did find at least some material that either he chose not to highlight or didn't come across. And secondly, um, after all, I'm born in the post-war period. I don't identify myself as a communist. I don't identify myself as a follower. I ask a different series of questions. My first books as a historian were on the Soviet dissident movement, so I have a completely different orientation politically and as a Jew. Um, and I, so because I'm asking a different kind of question or asking it from a different point of view, I think my answers will be different, and if they're worthwhile, if they're compelling, if they're suggestive, then the book I'm creating and the account and the portrait I'm creating is, is worth doing. Um, I did write an earlier book, which is a more comprehensive biography of Ilya Ehrenberg, and there are other books about Ehrenberg, but it really was the first biography, I, I think it's fair to say. And there I was the first really to combine material from the Soviet side. I started under Brezhnev and finished under Yeltsin and also on the American side, getting in, you know, interviewing 100 people who knew him, going to the State Department records, reading Western press, which no Soviet writer about Ehrenberg ever had the chance to do until then. So no matter when you're writing, if you come with a good set of questions, your answers will be different. And because you're a different generation, different experience, um, you should end up with a different kind of book that hopefully will be worth, worth having. I have a very different answer. Um, there was a published biography of my father in 1990 by James Atlas. Um, there was, and uh, that was re received ambivalently by, by the public. Uh, and there is now being uh, a researched and authorized biography by Zachary Leader, who uh, wrote a, bi a very comprehensive biography of, of Kingsley Amos, and is now writing a very comprehensive biography of my father. And uh, the way I handled this, basically, was that I told Zachary Leader that I would do anything I could do to help him short of telling him anything about my father. <laughs> uh, and the reason is, in the back of my mind, even though he started before me, uh, he's taken on a much larger task. And it was clear to me that the things that I had to talk about were not the kinds of things that he was ever going to know to ask me that everything that I wrote, or much of what I wrote, came so much from the personal that I didn't really think, as thorough as he is, and he's extremely thorough, I get emails from him about what our address was in Paris when I was five years old, and, you know, and I don't know, and then he sends me you know, three paragraph emails about that this was my father's studio, and then we moved in, and then you know, we moved out, and there was such and such lived next door. And I'm going, OK. Um, but I, there was a level of intimacy that I tried to go after in my memoir that I just didn't think, first of all, I didn't want to share it very selfishly with anybody until I got it out, got it on paper, and knew what I was going to say. And then by that time, it became so personal that it was just clear to me that Zach Leader, as, as able as he is, 
that's not what he's going for. He's, you know, he's, he has a very different task. And so I, I felt like I was, in a way, sort of running free. I will say that I used um, Mr. Alice's book as a sort of memory prompt. I read it, and then I would dictate into the computer because it was sort of, you know, my life and Saul's life and my mother's life to a lesser extent. I just use it as a catalyst for my thinking. How did your perception of your subject change during the course of your working on these books? Well, I, I, I hope it did change. First, you learn more, and then that has to adjust your thinking. But I remember coming across uh, a letter that uh, Trotsky wrote to Philip Robb in the late 30s. Robb was one of the editors of Partisan Review. And I ended up using a quotation from the letter as the epigraph to the book, where he says, uh, you know, nothing important has been achieved in history without fanaticism. And that he could write this in the late 30s, after all he had endured, after all that had happened in the Soviet Union and the purge trials, and still he was an advocate for fanaticism. Um, kind of underscored for me that this was a shadow over his entire career as a revolutionary. And to me, it was very much a part of his tragedy. Uh, that he could not, in the end, you know, uh, he couldn't renounce himself. He couldn't renounce his, his idea of himself as a revolutionary. Uh, so he had to defend the revolution even while it was destroying the country and destroying his own family and himself. I think I was most surprised by the effect that Solomon's story has had on, on kind of the history of culture. Um, for example, readers were long fascinated with his wealth. He's, reputed to be the richest man of his time. And uh, the question that occurred to readers was, where did it come from? And uh, in the 15th century, when, uh, as uh, Europe uh, began to acquire the ability to kind of send ships long distances, people began to look for the source of this wealth. And I was surprised to learn that among those searchers was Christopher Columbus, uh, who was searching, among other things, for uh, this place called Ophir, the source of Solomon's legendary wealth and actually thought he found it in what is now the Dominican Republic. And when he didn't discover any gold there, he was placed under arrest by the, by the authorities, um, brought back to Europe. Eventually, however, he returned, and he, he sought Solomon's gold again on the coast of what is now Panama. Um, and that then led to this you know, centuries-long search by Spanish, Portuguese, uh, British explorers searching for the source of Solomon's wealth that had a devastating impact on the various countries that they looked in. So um, I was surprised by that story that, that Solomon played such an important role in kind of European coloni colonization and, uh, and, the, and the rape of so many different regions. Frank, did your perception of your father I'm change? sorry? Did your perception of yes, your father Yes, I think quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, didn't have not, I didn't have an easy time with my father after about age 30. Um, sometimes I like to say that I was brought up by Augie March and that when I turned 25 or 30, my father became Arthur Samler, <laughs> which was not pleasant. Uh, and um, I fought with my father a lot. Uh, I, he took a lot of political and social positions I didn't uh, very much like. Uh, and um, he, there, were, there were a number of conflicts between he and I, including my participation or lack of it in Jewish life, uh, which was a particular sore point. Uh, and so I wrote my first draft, and I sent it off to two people who knew both of us very well, and Gene Goodhart, who um, may, some of you may know as a memoirist, uh, as a long-term friend, said, Gregory, you can do better than this. Um, you know, you're not being fair to your father as an old man at all. And, you know, I really think that I was developed an appreciation for him as a great writer um, after he passed away, when the personal stuff, I mean, it's in the book, that's why I gave you a sample of it, but also I've now come to see th these things, as I said, I can't see it as literature, Pop. I now can see it as literature in a way that I could not before I wrote this book, and that's that's delightful, and it's big. And also, I, you know, I spent six hours a day locked up in my study with Mozart blaring in my ears the way he did for 70 years. And so you know, we had a shared a sort of common experience of writership, which also, I th think, brought me closer to, to him as a writer. <laughs>
Great. Well, on that note, I want to say thank you to each of you. We have some time now for questions. So I'd like to open it up to the audience. Oh, I met Saul Bellow, got a photo with him, very sweet man, but what I'm interested in is anger. Uh, I think later in life, you know, things are glossed over. Three examples in his case, and I wonder if you could maybe give the, the reason. Uh, he wrote a, a letter against Nation magazine types, where he lists, this is Chris Hitchens, he was angry about that. 17 elements of, of hatred that the baby snatchers, wife beaters, I mean, enormous anger. And then in, in the footnote it says, and later on I became friendly with Chris and just ignore this. Uh, the second example uh, of, of his letters about William uh, Phillips, he's trying to blackball him out of societies, but in the memorial volume of William Phillips, there's this Saul Bellow story and a quote from Saul Bellow. I mean, in later life, the wonder is, did he soften up, uh, or is it part of a revisional history? Uh, the key to it might be the James T. Farrell reference in that biography, where Farrell was given the Thoreau Award at the Arts and Sciences uh, Society, and Saul Bellow was in charge of that, and he says, well, here's a guy, Saul Bellow, who's ignored me all my life, but now they seem to be giving me an award. So was it softening, or is it just revisionized history? I don't think it was either. I, you know, I mean, you know, if you're asking for consistency for my father, forget it. <laughs> now, he was prickly, he was irritable, people got under his skin, I got under his skin, my brothers got under his skin, you know, uh, literary adversaries got under his skin. Sometimes, I mean, he, he always forgave us. And, you know, sometimes he had long-standing enmities with people, sometimes he had long-standing friendships that, became, you know, became, you know, enmities. Uh, he certainly had a, I don't know if he had a falling out with Ed Shills, but they certainly you know, terminated their, you know, their friendship. Um, so you know, I guess what I'm saying is he was prickly, always. And he, he, you, you cited three examples, and I could give you 50 more. Hi. Thank you all. It's wonderful. I'd like to ask our brilliant moderator, if you would tell us something about your work on Shirley Jackson along the lines that you've been asking the panelists about, but particularly what was her relationship to Jewishness and being a Jewish woman? Um, I, I forgot for a second, I thought you were going to ask me what was her relation to Solomon Trotsky and Saul Bellow. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Shirley Jackson actually wasn't Jewish, so I feel a little bit like I, I'm here in my, in my other, with my other hat on as a literary critic who writes often about Jewish books. Um, she was um, married to the Jewish literary critic Stanley Edgar Hyman, um, who was very famous in the 40s, 50s, 60s as a book critic for The New Yorker, The New Leader, among other publications, now has faded into the dust of history, which is a cautionary tale for all of us who make our living as book critics. Um, but um, so she did actually, while Shirley Jackson was not a Jewish woman, she did identify um, somewhat with Judaism, and the family considers themselves, whose name was Hyman, after all, considered themselves to be in some ways a Jewish family. And I think um, the anti-Semitism that she saw Stanley experience from really from the time that they were undergraduates together at Syracuse, and then later on they lived in um, Bennington, Vermont uh, for almost the rest of their lives, um, a very small town in which I believe Stanley Hyman was the only Jew in residence. Um, and it's believed that some of their experiences there when it, you know, informed her writing in The Lottery, which obviously is about prejudice. and many other things. So yes, I do want to, I want to correct any conception that Shirley Jackson is a Jewish writer, but there is a, a Jewish connection in her work. Hi, I'm Eric Alterman. I guess I'm one of those Nation magazine types that Saul Bellow would despise. Um, I'm actually writing about Saul Bellow um, for a book I'm writing about um, Jewish cultural figures of the period. He's a chapter. And uh, I imagine it must be very frustrating for you because there's so much written about your father that people feel like they know him when they only know a certain part of him. One thing uh, I was surprised to hear you say um, 
was that he was angry about you for not participating sufficiently in Jewish life. The question I was going to ask you, and it's related, is what's with all this theosophy stuff that he was always interested in? <laughs> and so my question is, what's with all this theosophy stuff, and how does that square with what you're saying is uh, important, the importantness of Jewishness in his life, um, as, a, you know, as your, far as your discussions go? Thank you. I, if I had four hours, I could probably give you half an answer. Uh, I, I'm, let me just talk about the spiritual question. Um, you know, as an older man, he became quite preoccupied with death, with the afterlife, or with the absence of information about the afterlife. He studied Rudolf Steiner, you know, in great depth, and many other people. He read, he thought deeply, he tried to emulate Steiner um, and Steiner, Steiner's practices. Uh, and then he gave up, I think, he, I think he gave up on, on Steiner. And I think he blamed himself, honestly. And I think in, in Humboldt's gift, you sort of see his confession of the inability to make the kind of demands, fulfill the kind of demands that Steiner, you know, demand, it demands. I mean, he's basically, you know, I, I understood, I understand this much of it, but it, in the first couple of chapters of a couple of books my father gave me, it says you have to just suspend your doubt. Well, he never could suspend his doubt. I mean, that's my answer is he was still the cerebral, intellectual person that he was. Um, and Steiner ex asked things of him he couldn't deliver. And I think he confesses as largely, largely to it in, in when Charlie Citrine talks about his inability to give up the corporal life. It's just too much fun. If I could make the question a little more pointed, though. I understand why he'd give up. I don't understand what he was doing there in the first place. There, there's, no, there's no one else in, his, in, in that circle of writers and thinkers with whom he was associated that had any interest in this stuff at all. And yet he pursued for so long. And you know, it might be my ignorance, but I just don't get the attraction in the first place. I think it gave the possibility. I mean, I, in my mind, Humboldt's gift is that there's an, you know, it's, it comes from the, the, the great beyond that Humboldt gives them another chance to do it right next time. That's my answer. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Susan Smith-Peter, and this is a question for Josh. Uh, I'm interested in, uh, if you could talk a little bit about uh, Trotsky's time here in New York, uh, perhaps also a little bit about the New York Public Library, and if it is true that there was a uh, headline in a Bronx paper uh, that said, Bronx man leads Russian revolution. <laughs> and, uh, but then, one, one more uh, part. I, I've read your work actually on Soviet dissidents. Yes. And I'm wondering if you see them as sort of uh, like rebellious sons or as heirs to Trotsky, or do you see them as two disjointed parts? Let me answer the, this last question. I don't think the dissidents I knew and still know don't see any connection to Trotsky. They've rejected the revolution, even those who are self-professed Marxists. Uh, like uh, General, late General Grigorenko, who was a Marxist member of the party, uh, they've rejected all those people. So although they may sympathize with Trotsky on a personal level, and certainly in a very uninformed way, I think, see him as an alternative to Stalin, um, they don't identify with him at all. Maybe some of them may see Bukharin as a more uh, possible alternative, but really they're rejecting the whole thing. Uh, in stages, you know, Sakharov first says, uh, how he, the regime had rejected Leninist principles. That's language he later never uses and apologizes for using. So let me just put that out there. Um, Trotsky came to New York because he was thrown out of Europe. He was thrown out of France because the Russians had Russian troops stationed on the Western Front and found it inconvenient to have a Russian revolutionary uh, during World War I who rejected the war altogether. So he was taken to Spain, and Spain wouldn't keep him but he was allowed to leave for America. And he was grateful for that because he was afraid he'd be sent back to Russia where he would ser uh, serve a life term under the Tsar anyway. Um, he came here in January. He left um, uh, uh, in the weeks following the abdication of the Tsar and just when Wilson was leading the US into World War I. So he was really here at a very important uh, point in history, at a hitch moment. He made his living writing for a, a, an emigre newspaper called Novi Mir, no, New World, who lent its name to his famous journal in Moscow. Bukharin was here. Uh, Alexander Kolontay was here. 
Um, and he was lecturing, he was traveling in Philadelphia and Boston. I, I'm not, well, I shouldn't say for sure to Boston. It was all over New York. Even now there's a corner just north of Central Park that people referred to as Trotsky's Corner, where he would give, you know, he would harangue the crowds from a soapbox. I did not myself see the headline that says Bronx Man Leads the Rep, but it's always possible, you know. It's possible. Uh, but there are many other myths that he was uh, in a movie, uh, all kinds of myths about the things he did here. Um, I, I never came across any hard evidence for that. Uh, I do believe the story I recounted to you about being in the, in, the, in the Jewish dairy restaurant, it wasn't because he was kosher. Trust me. Uh, I think he just found the food familiar. It was Russians. The waiter spoke Russian. They were like him. They were emigres. He felt comfortable there. Uh, and he was always surrounded by Jews because all the, so many revolutionaries were Jews. No matter where he was, Vienna, Paris, uh, Petersburg, Moscow, New York. Uh, and, you know, so he gravitated toward them. Just, uh, it was natural. One last question. Oh, I'm sorry. You're being asked to go to the microphone. Yeah. A quick question about the role of Bennington, uh, in which you describe at that point as the uh, Hymans, uh, Shirley Jackson and her husband as being the only, as being he being the only Jew there and as a member of the faculty at Bennington, but which, as I understood it, uh, given its founding and it's a sort of a Black Mountain college for very rich girls at a certain point, but its faculty as artists and writers and critics and residents, uh, at least at different times, never mind its, its uh, student body, which included Helen Frankenthaler and others, how could the, the, the Hyman have been the only Jew that the uh, presumably provincial uh, anti-Semites of Bennington uh, found so anomalous. Right. No, that, that, you're, you're absolutely right, and that wasn't what I meant at all. Uh, Hyman, there were, of course, many Jews on the faculty at Bennington, including Bernard Malamud and many others. I believe that the, Hymans may have, the Hyman may have been the only Jew living in the town of North Bennington, which is a separate place. The Hy they, they made a point of living off campus because they did want to mingle with the townspeople, I think, and, get, and Bring, bring up their children in a more, you know, more open, more what they thought was a more open, more diverse, more socially economically diverse society than the very narrow confines of the of the campus, which I'm sure you know was extremely privileged at the time. The student body was very, very wealthy, and most of the faculty, almost all the faculty, chose to live within the campus itself. So what I meant actually was North Bennington, which is a distinct location from Bennington College. And I've been told that um, some of the townspeople who lived in North Bennington at the time, including someone named Mr. Powers who ran the grocery store, that these personalities are recognizable in the characters in the lottery. Anyway, we are now out of time, so please join me in thanking our panelists.